Recording in progress. Good evening, Book Passage customers and community. Thank you so much for joining us. We are very excited about our program this evening. We have Mishu Kaku here with us, Quantum Supremacy, and we'll get to all the good things about that. I first just want to welcome you all. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, we would love that. And this event will be archived. In other words, we're going to record it, and then it'll be on our website for your uh, viewing at a later date. And of course, as you watch tonight, uh, if you've got friends and family out there who were not able to tune in, please let them know that they can take a look and watch this event at their leisure. Again, it'll be on our website at bookpassage.com. So welcome, welcome to Book Passage. Um, for those of you who are new to our community, a very hearty welcome to our loyal customers out there. Thank you so much. We really appreciate all your business over the years. Book Passage does have two locations. We have our store in Corte Madera. And of course we have our store in the San Francisco Ferry Building. And both stores are open seven days a week. So come on in. You can buy your books by shopping and browsing. You can buy them on our website. Or of course, you can always call us on the phone. And unlike many other locations, we do answer the phone with a live person. And we would be happy to assist you that way. Of course, books make the very best gifts. So if I'm speaking to any business owners out there or people who have uh, pr uh, the privilege to buy gifts for their clients and staff, think about that. A book, especially this one by Michio Kaku would be an amazing gift. We offer very generous discounts for bulk orders and we ship all over the country. So if that is something that interests you, we call it our corporate orders program. We are one of the biggest in that in industry and we would love to assist you. Just give one of our stores a call. We will be happy to help you. So again, we are very proud to bring you this excellent programming and most of it is free. We want you to view all of our events on our website. Again, that is bookpassage.com. We have a very busy spring and summer schedule. Lots of amazing authors on our docket. I am gonna mention just a few that we have upcoming. On June 8th at 6 o'clock p.m., we will be hosting James Comey, the former director of the FBI, and he will be presenting his newest mystery, Central Park West. This event will take place in our Corte Madera store, and it'll also be available to view online. And then on Wednesday, June 14th at 5.30 p.m., we will be hosting the best-selling author, David Gran, and he will be discussing his new bestseller, The Wager. I have had a chance to read this one. It is wonderful. It is also slated for a major motion picture probably next year. The event will be both in person in Corte Madera and online. So again, please look at our calendar on bookpassage.com. We have all these events and many more, including classes, and all kinds of fun things going on at the store. We don't want you to miss any of the exciting, wonderful things happening at Book Passage. And at Book Passage, our mission is to enrich, engage, and inspire. And as many of you know, we have been a Bay Area institution for over 40 years, and we're very proud of that. It's also a family-owned business. So again, thank you so much to all of our loyal customers out there. We really appreciate all the support. Well, this evening, we will be enlightened. Many of us have heard about the basic concept of quantum computing. What can be a lot harder is to understand how this change can make computers faster and affect different fields and industries. Mishu Kaku's newest title, Quantum Supremacy, helps to bridge that gap for the average person. You won't need a thorough understanding of physics or computer science to get plenty of knowledge on this book. And while this topic may seem dry to some, the bold predictions and simple prose ensures that you will be riveted. In the not so distant future, quantum computing can change our daily lives in unimaginable ways. It can solve major challenges such as climate change, the global food crisis, 
and deadly diseases. Mishu Kaku is a professor of physics at the City University of New York. He is co-founder of String Field Theory and the author of many widely acclaimed science books. And again, most have been a New York Times bestseller. I'll just mention a few. Hyperspace, Beyond Einstein, Physics of the Impossible, and Physics of the Future. We have all of those for sale at Book Passage, along with his newest one that we're presenting today, Quantum Supremacy. We have all seen Michio Kaku on TV as a science correspondent for CBS's This Morning and host of the radio programs Science Fantastic and Explorations in Science. We are so honored that he has joined us this evening and will present his newest book to our wide and extended Book Passage community. Let's give a very warm welcome to the brilliant and enthusiastic science communicator, Mr. Michio Kaku. Well, thank you very much. After such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. You know, in this business, I get a chance to interact with some of the world's top scientists. And whenever I talk to another scientist, I ask them the key question, the most important question of all. I ask them, is there intelligent life on the earth? Well, I was watching the Kardashians on TV the other day, and I've come to the conclusion that, nope, no way. There is no intelligent life on this planet, except for those people who are watching this video presentation. You represent the finest in intellectual curiosity. You represent a thirst for learning. People like you are the ones who invent the future. Well, these are just some of the bestsellers that I've written, and I'm proud to say that Quantum Supremacy, just today, just today hit the New York Times bestseller list. So unfortunately, I won't be able to sign copies of the book there because I'm in New York City right now. But uh, usually after I sign your books, you can go to eBay and auction them off for money. Yes, you can actually make money after attending some of my talks. Well, these are just a few of the books that I've written. Uh, Physics of the Future talks about artificial intelligence, robotics, and a day in the life 100 years from now. Physics of the Impossible talks about time travel, going through wormholes, traveling faster than the speed of light, going to the stars. In the future of the mind, I talk about the fact that we physicists can now probe blood flow in the living brain using MRI scans. Believe it or not, we can actually trace thoughts, thoughts as they're being created by the living brain with MRI machines. For example, I was reading a medical journal the other day, and it said that we can actually now look at certain thoughts and expressions and see what it means for blood flow. For example, everybody knows that when a man talks to a pretty girl, he often talks stupid. Well, we now know the reason. We did blood flow analysis, and we found out that when a man talks to a pretty girl, blood often drains from the prefrontal cortex, and without blood flow, he starts to act stupid. So many of the old wives' tales can now be understood. But today, I'm going to talk about my latest book, Quantum Supremacy, now a New York Times bestseller. First of all, what does that mean, quantum supremacy? Quantum supremacy is the time when a quantum computer that computes on atoms, not transistors, can exceed the power of the world's greatest supercomputer on certain tasks. That was achieved two years ago. There is a race, a race between China on one hand and American companies, IBM, Google, Microsoft, you name it, all the American big companies are working on quantum computers because whoever controls quantum computers could control the world economy. In the same way that the people who control digital computers can influence the world economy, the nation or company that rules quantum computation 
could rule the world economy. So you can imagine what's at stake. Everything is at stake. But to understand this, let's take a look at history a little bit. We think that computers are very new, but actually 2000 years ago, the first computer was invented. On the lower left, it's a piece of junk that was found on the bottom of the Mediterranean Ocean near the Greek island. Um, and it was a piece of junk. But when you remove the coral and the dirt, people began to suspect that, hey, there's something fishy going on. This is not an ordinary rock. This is a machine. And then scientists put this piece of rock under an x-ray machine, and they were staggered at what they found. They found that this piece of rock, 2,000 years old, was the most advanced analog computer for the next 2,000 years. Some Greek genius 2,000 years ago invented this analog computer, which could compute the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the Moon, all of it in this device. There's speculation that the people who made this device made it as a gift for the coronation of Julius Caesar, but that's just a theory. The point is that it took another 2,000 years for the rest of the world to catch up to what the Greeks did 2,000 years ago. We started to compute on bees, like an abacus. We started to compute on sticks, like a slide roll. And we used gears, levers, pulleys, and string in order to do addition and subtraction. So this is how we were for 2,000 years, retracing the steps that the Greeks had already worked out to create analog computers. Well, at the height of the British Empire, the British Empire needed adding machines to calculate interest rates, to calculate navigation charts, to calculate money exchanges. And so Charles Babbage, shown here, became the father of the analog computer. He designed some of the greatest computers of his time in the late 1800s in London. You turn the crank and calculations would be performed. In fact, one of his students, one of his students was a member of the aristocracy, Lady Lovelace. She took an interest in this machine of Charles Babbage and she became the world's first programmer. She actually published it. The very first published computer program to calculate the Bernoulli numbers were done by Lady Lovelace. Unfortunately, Charles Babbage ran out of money. He got into feuds with other people. And so his creme de la creme machine was never built. Almost a century later, scientists were curious at the museum in London. So they built it. They finished the work of Charles Babbage. And here it is, it works. Too bad it didn't work 100 years before. But this is the world's most sophisticated analog computer. Then comes World War II. The Nazis used this machine called the Enigma to communicate with this far-flung uh, empire of hired killers and SS troops. And the Allies are at a loss. They have to break the code to understand what the Nazis are planning. So what do they do? They ask England's top mathematician, Alan Turing, to design a machine that could decode the Nazi code. And on the left, finally, we have a movie dedicated to the heritage of Alan Turing. He was the mathematician who laid the groundwork for computer science and also robotics. He devised what is called the Turing machine. You start with digital tape, zeros and one, zeros and one, zeros and one, and you perform a calculation on it, turning it into another series of zeros and ones, zeros and ones. This is the essence of computation. All digital computers are direct lineage from this original Turing machine. 
On the left, you can actually see the tape and you can see the processor that performs a calculation. He systematized the laws of artificial intelligence and also com computation. But it's a sad story. You know, in America, we celebrated our scientists, people like Ra Oppenheimer, who built the atomic bomb. They were heroes after World War II. But Alan Turing's name was secret. So secret that the people never knew, of England never knew, who broke the code. It's, it's estimated that he shortened World War II by two years. World War II could have lasted till 1947. And he saved tens of thousands of lives by intercepting the secret Nazi code. So what happened to him? Well, you can see the complexity of the machines that his laboratory built. But one day, one day there was a burglary in his apartment. The police were called and the police accidentally stumbled on the fact that he was gay. Well, it was illegal to be gay in the post-war era. He was put on trial. The judge ordered him to undergo horrible hormone treatments. He started to grow breasts. He became depressed. And one day, he committed suicide. He was the hero of World War, of World War II. He's one of the reasons why we speak English here today rather than German. And there's no swastika behind me because of this gentleman. But what did England do? to this tremendous genius, they killed him basically. Well, he took an apple, coated it with cyanide, ate the apple and committed suicide. Some people think that the symbol of Apple computers is an apple with a bite taken off, maybe just maybe in tribute to the work of Alan Turing. But the work of Alan Turing kept on going. He introduced electricity which meant that you could use vacuum tubes and eventually transistors to do calculations. Computers today, you can put a billion transistors on something the size of your thumbnail. That's the power of a Turing machine, but it's flattening out. This is Moore's law, which says that computer power doubles every 18 months. It's held steady since World War II, but now it's slowing down. Now, people know that you buy a computer today, two years from now, it'll be twice as powerful and you want to upgrade. Would you upgrade your computer knowing that it's just as powerful as last year's model? The world economy could be destabilized. Who's going to want to buy a computer knowing that computers never change in power? In other words, this curve is flattening out now. This curve is flattening out because we're now computing on transistors that are about the size of, well, maybe 20 atoms, 20 to 50 atoms across. In, in perhaps 10 years, it'll be five atoms across. At that point, Moore's law collapses. Silicon Valley, the engine of the economy, could become a rust belt. Think of that, a rust belt, unemployment in Silicon Valley. Now, why? Well, this gentleman here, Richard Feynman, was winner of the Nobel Prize, and he was not happy with this second era of computation. Why do we have to use digital? Does Mother Nature use digital? Where in the universe do we see binary arithmetic of zeros and ones, zeros and ones? You can't model Mother Nature this way. Mother Nature is quantum mechanical, uses electron waves, that obey an equation, the Schrodinger equation. So Richard Feynman said, we need a new computer. Look at this, this is the wave function of hydrogen. This is the simplest atom you can conceive of. And you can see that there are waves of electron probabilities surrounding the nucleus of the atom. In other words, Silicon Valley will inevitably become a Rust Belt. This means that quantum computers, the next step is the ultimate computer, a computer which calculates on atoms rather than transistors. When transistors are 50, five atoms or so across, at that point, all hell breaks loose, your computer short circuits and becomes useless. So how does that work? Well, you see, atoms can spin. They can spin up or spin down in a magnetic field. 
This represents zero and one. That's how you do computation, on or off, zeros and one, plus or minus. Anything that's binary can be used for calculations. But you see, quantum computers are different. Instead of being up and down, up or down, quantum computers can be sideways. They can be in any angle. And the question is, how many more states are there if the axis of rotation could be in any direction simultaneously? Well, the answer is obvious, infinite. There are infinitely more states you can write down wobbling at different angles than in a digital computer, which is simply up or down. Think about that. This increases the power of a quantum computer by a factor of millions. For example, here's an example. Let's put a mouse in a maze. How does a mouse in a maze, how does the digital computer calculate how to get through it? Well, after each path, it has to make a decision, left or right, left or right. Now, how many paths are there? There could be hundreds of different kinds of paths in this maze. That's why it's so slow and tedious for a digital computer to calculate something as simple as going through a maze. Now, let's use a quantum computer. A quantum computer calculates all possible paths simultaneously. What? Now, that's not possible, you say to yourself. How can you be two places at the same time? Ever since you were a child, people always told you you cannot be two places at the same time. Well, we lied to you. Sorry about that, but electrons are two places at the same time all the time. That's the power of the laser. That's the power of the internet. That's the power of modern electronics. That's the power of GPS. Why do we have these wondrous properties? Because the electron can be more than two places at the same time. Not only that, but in a quantum computer, the electrons talk to each other. In fact, they talk to each other faster than the speed of light. And so that's yet another reason why quantum computers are so much more powerful. And that's why Mother Nature uses the quantum theory to calculate flowers, calculate plants and living things. Mother Nature doesn't use binary. Binary is only used by homo sapiens. Mother Nature uses the quantum principle where objects can be two places at the same time. Now, what does a quantum computer look like? First of all, they exist. We hit, we hit quantum supremacy about two years ago. Google and the Chinese were able to create quantum computers that are millions of times more powerful than a regular supercomputer on certain tasks. Now we gotta be careful. A, a quantum computer that works for general tasks that you can program, we don't have that yet. But on certain select problems, quantum computers exist and they can outrace any known digital computer. Well, this is what they look like. In fact, at the end of the month, 60 minutes, asked me to fly out to Santa Barbara to visit the quantum computers made by Google. They're one of the leaders in this whole process to photograph, to photograph quantum computers to show people that this is coming, is coming exponentially fast. Now, why does it look like a chandelier? It's not a chandelier at all. These are cooling pipes. You have to cool it down to near absolute zero. Now, why is that? If somebody sneezes in the other room, somebody burps, somebody falls down, that vibration is enough to shatter the vibration of the atoms inside the device and ruin the calculation. So that's why we have to cool it down to an absolute zero. So where is the computer? At the very bottom, can you look at the very bottom of this thing? At the very bottom, you see where the actual computer is located. Everything else is cooling pipes because you have to reduce it to near absolute zero. Now. Let me let you in on something. Mother Nature does it practically for free. Mother Nature doesn't use chandeliers. Mother Nature doesn't use at near absolute zero cooling pipes. Mother Nature performs calculations at room temperature. How does it do it? We're not sure. In other words, 
Mother Nature is still ahead of us in quantum computers. Very embarrassing. Now, in America, we use electrons. Electrons can be many places at the same time. That's called electronics. That's why we have lasers. And we use that for computation. This is what the Chinese do. The Chinese use optical computers to do calculations. And this is the Chinese thing. Look at it. It's a monster, right? You can't put this on your wristwatch. But this device here on certain tasks can outraise the, the fastest digital supercomputer on the planet Earth. So the Chinese and Google set the world's record first. Look at this thing. It's a mess, but it works. Now, you may say to yourself, am I going to put that thing on my wristwatch? Am I going to wear that as jewelry? How can I wear a quantum computer? Well, you don't have to. In the future, we'll have quantum computers in the cloud. You'll never see them. They're in the cloud. But the communication with the quantum computer is done through an interface like your wristwatch, your jewelry, maybe your contact lens. Maybe you will blink and you will be online communicating with a quantum computer. Now think about that. This device here will recognize people's faces. You'll identify who they are. You'll understand their background, their history, just by blinking. Think about that. And who are the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students studying for final examinations. They will love quantum computers. They'll simply download all the answers to my final exam and pass the course because all human knowledge will be up there in the web. Also, you can see biographies of people by looking at them. This could be really handy. Let's say you're on a blind date and your blind date says that he's single, he's rich, he's powerful, and he's unattached. But your contact lens says, nope, He's a loser. He has three kids. He pays child support. Stay away from this guy. This guy is a loser. This could also be very handy at a cocktail party. Let's say you're in a cocktail party and there's some very important people at that cocktail party, but you don't know who they are. In the future, you'll always know who to suck up to at any cocktail party. Now, as I said before, these things exist already. Mother Nature is way ahead of us. Mother Nature uses the quantum principle to do calculations, making possible life. One of the consequences of quantum computation is life itself. Take a look at photosynthesis. This is the most important process, biological process on the planet Earth. And we scientists are still scratching our heads trying to figure out how does Mother Nature do it? Mother Nature takes sunlight, mixes it with carbon dioxide, little water, and what does it create? Sugars and oxygen. This is amazing. Why are we here today? Why are we here today talking about this? Because of this process. Can we unlock it and create artificial photosynthesis? No, but that's the dream. People are now trying to create artificial photosynthesis to create and pollinate and create as many plants and vegetables as possible, much more efficient than what Mother Nature can do. Also, the aerospace industry is interested. Remember that general purpose quantum computers are not being sold yet, but specialized purpose quantum computers are being sold. D-Wave, for example, in Canada is already selling quantum computers that can do optimization and minimization. For example, the aerospace industry is, there, is interested. You realize that in the future, our planes could be supersonic. You'll have breakfast in New York. You'll have afternoon tea in China. You'll come back and go to bed in New York City all in one day. Now, didn't we have the Concorde? Yeah, but it crashed. And who wanted the Concorde? Because the Concorde made a sonic boom. That's why many people outlawed the sonic, outlawed the Concorde superliner because it created a sonic boom that shattered people's windows. Who wants that? 
But that's because they were using 1960 technology. I mean, that's dinosaur era. 1960 technology is old hat. Now we use quantum computers and we can calculate airflow over the wing and we could reduce or eliminate the sonic boom. This is creating a gold rush. All the aerospace companies now are fielding designs for a supersonic jet. And of course, beyond that, we're going to the moon. This is a moon rocket. It unfortunately blew up last month, but Elon Musk has made the world's most powerful rocket. Because of computers, we can make these rockets reusable again. This is called the Starship. It's designed to go to the moon and even Mars. However, originally, the name of this rocket was BFR. And people began to wonder, what does BFR stand for? Well, B stands for big, R stands for rocket, and you can imagine what the F stands for. And Mercedes-Benz is interested in buying a quantum computer. It wants to use quantum computers to design airflow over cars to reduce uh, air friction and to make it economical so that you can serve on gasoline. And the French are betting on this, on the solar era. But let's be frank. We've been talking about solar power, solar power for decades. I can remember as a child, people were talking about solar cities. They never came. What happened to the dream that never came? Well, the reason is batteries do not obey Moore's law. We forget that. We think that everything obeys Moore's law, that everything doubles in power every 18 months. Yeah, that's electricity, but not solar cells, not car batteries. They don't have in price every 18 months. We need super batteries. And where do you get super batteries? In the memory of a quantum computer. It can do chemical reactions in its memory. You don't even have to have a chemical laboratory. Think about this, a chemist, without a chemical laboratory. Now, does this mean that chemists are gonna be put out of work? Well, it means that chemists who do not use quantum computers will be out of work. They'll be unemployed. So who will have a job? Chemists who do use quantum computers will have a job. There's a lesson there. And look at the first green revolution. Before World War I, the Germans were able to perfect this process to take nitrogen from the air and make ammonia and fertilizer from it. And this created a revolution in agriculture. 50% of the atoms of your body, get this. I was quite shocked when I learned this. 50% of the atoms of your body are the result of this process. But it's polluting. It causes problems. We have to replace it. But how do you replace this process with a quantum computer? Now, Mother Nature does it almost for free. On the right, you see legumes, vegetables that can take oxygen from the atmosphere and from it make ammonia and fertilizer. On the left is the molecule that can do it. Now, can you use zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones to duplicate that model? Look at that molecule. There's no way that zeros and ones, zeros and ones can create fertilizer. No, that's where you need quantum computers. You need the quantum to understand the quantum. And of course, medicine is the next target. We're going to be able to revolutionize medicine, change our lifespan, cure incurable diseases with quantum computers. For example, how do you find the next wonder drug? Ever thought about that? Well, you get thousands of petri dishes shown here. You put a germ in each one, and then you put the chemical you're testing in each one, and then you cross your fingers. That's right. We're clueless. We don't know how these things work. It's just magic. We put them together, cross our fingers that they work. That's the old fashioned way to cure illnesses. In the future, quantum computers will decode the molecule that causes these problems and cure it. Now, can a digital computer do that? No, 
This is way beyond what a, what a digital computer can do. It computes on zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. Mother Nature does not talk the language of zeros and ones, zeros and ones. For example, this is what causes Alzheimer's disease. By the time you're in your 80s, roughly half the population has Alzheimer's. Think about that. In this room, if you fast forward this room so that everyone is in their 80 years of age, half of you will be babbling. Half of you will have Alzheimer's. Think about that. Well, we now realize something about Alzheimer's. When we look at the molecular structure, we realize that it could twist to the right or twist to the left. There are two ways it could twist. And we found out the version that twists to the right is the one that causes dementia. Twisting to the left does not. In other words, perhaps one day, a quantum computer will be able to eliminate the disease of the century, Alzheimer's disease. And what about energy? Just last year in California, at the Livermore National Laboratory, they hit break even. Energy in equaled energy out. So fusion power, the power of the sun on the earth, a power that creates almost no nuclear waste, a power that creates no meltdowns, could give us unlimited power with quantum computers stabilizing the vacuum configuration of these, of these things. So once again, we see another practical application for energy using quantum computers. And my field, cosmology and the universe, is also being affected. On the left is the world's largest atom smasher, the Large Hadron Collider based outside Geneva, Switzerland. It is so big, you could put the city of Geneva inside the machine. That's how big it is. And on the right, we use now quantum computers to decode what happens when you smash atoms apart. In other words, we're using quantum computers to recreate a piece of Genesis. The creation of the universe started this way. And we're now using quantum computers right now, quantum computers to help to decode these things. So we'll answer the greatest philosophical question of all. Why are we here? And the Big Bang. Yes, at the very bottom, you see the Big Bang. Time goes in the upward direction. So you can see the rapid expansion of the universe. We should be able to understand the nature of the Big Bang itself because of a quantum computer. Now, I work professionally on string theory, which we think is the equation that governs this expansion. But the equations are so complicated, no human has been able to solve them. This is where quantum computers can come in. Quantum computers may be required to solve the theory of everything. We think we have the theory. We just can't solve it. No one here on Earth is smart enough to solve it. And if any of you in the audience, if any of you in the audience ever solve the theory of everything, what should you do? Tell me first. Yeah, we'll publish together and we'll split the Nobel Prize money together, you and me. And what about the aging process? It's no fun getting old, but we now know what aging is. We didn't know what aging was before the, the genetic revolution. Now we know what aging is. Aging is the buildup of error, mistakes, mistakes at the molecular, atomic, cellular level. That's all aging is. Cells make mistakes. They get sluggish, like a car that has built up uh, carbon deposits. It gets sluggish. It goes into senescence, and finally it dies. That's why we have to die. It's a law of physics. Physics says that in a closed system, all organisms must eventually die. But there's a loophole. Notice that I said in a closed system, you must eventually die. But what about an open system where light, energy, food comes in from the outside? Then it may be possible to slow down the aging process. For example, where does aging take place in a car? Well, think about it. Aging takes place in the engine. Why? That's where you have wear and tear. That's where you have carbon deposits building up. 
That's where you have all sorts of uh, wear and chemicals that degrade the system inside the engine. Well, what is the engine of the cell? The mitochondria. So we now know where aging is located. And already we're hot on the trail of beginning to repair some of the mistakes of the aging process. Now, we haven't done it yet. I'll be very clear about that. We do not yet have the fountain of youth. But now we see it, that it's a target that we may be able to hit one day, the aging process. And what about cancer? You know, by the time you have a tumor, it could be too late. You have several billion cancer cells growing in your body. Your doctor shakes his or her head and says, surgery is required immediately. No ifs, ands, or buts. You are on the operating table. That's today. Tomorrow, you'll do a blood test. And the blood test analyzes your genetic structure and identifies 50 different types of cancer. This is today. This is not tomorrow. The FDA has already approved this. We can now identify 50 different kinds of cancers. In the future, we'll identify thousands of different kinds of cancer in your blood. Think about that. Now, where are we going to do this? Perhaps in your toilet. Your toilet will help you cure cancer. Your toilet will be connected to a quantum computer. It'll analyze your bodily fluids and tell you if you have cancer cells floating in your blood and remove them perhaps 10 years before a tumor forms. This is amazing. It means that we may be able to stop cancer in its tracks with a quantum computer that analyzes blood flow in your bodily fluids. Think about that. You know, George Washington, the father of America, how did he die? Look it up in history book. They killed him. The doctors bled him to death because that's what you did for sick people in the old days. They didn't know any better. Life-giving blood was bled from George Washington. We're not going to do that again. In fact, blood could be the way that we in which we detect cancers. And let me not tell you the downside of this technology. It's a double-edged sword. This computer, the quantum computer, is so powerful that it can break any known digital code. Now, it's not ready yet, so don't get fearful. But it means that one day, maybe within 10 years or so, when we have commercially available quantum computers, you'll be able to crack the CIA, the FBI, all their codes the crown jewels of a nation, the nuclear codes, their secrets, all that stuff can be downloaded in a quantum computer. So it means that already scientists are working on ways to prevent that from happening. Now, let me just say a few things about the mystery of how, why quantum computers are so powerful. Why are quantum computers so powerful? Because they compute not just on one electron, they compute on infinite number of electrons vibrating all in unison. For example, on the left, we have a light bulb. It shoots particles of light through two holes. And what do you get on the other side? An interference pattern. You've all done this. You've seen this in high school. This is called interference because the left-handed electron interferes with the right-handed electron. These two electrons interfere to create that pattern on the right. Now let's reduce it to one atom or one electron. Let's shoot one electron through two holes. What we find has shocked the world of science. Physicists even today yell and scream at each other to figure out why this is true. If you have one electron going through two holes, then the pattern that it makes on the screen is a pattern of dots. But the dots are arranged like an interference pattern. This means that an object, one electron, interfered with itself. Now, how can you do that? How can one electron interfere with itself? Well, one way to do it is with a parallel universe. In other words, if you put a cat in a box called the Schrodinger cat, the cat can be dead and alive simultaneously. You are neither dead nor alive. 
And then the next question that people ask me is, is Elvis Presley still alive in a parallel universe? Well, yeah, Elvis Presley is still alive, but not in our universe, in a parallel universe. Because if the universe is like a motion picture, the motion picture splits in half. In fact, it splits an infinite number of times. How does that work? Well, that was once explained to me by Steve Weinberg, winner of the Nobel Prize. He used a simple example. He said, think of your living room. Your living room is full of radio signals, radio signals from rock stations and blues stations, hundreds of radio stations in your living room, but you can't hear them because your radio is not vibrating in unison with those frequencies. Your radio only vibrates in fre frequency in unison with one radio station. That's why you hear one radio station. Now says Professor Weinberg, winner of the Nobel Prize, let's remove that, the radio, and replace it with electrons. All of a sudden now you're surrounded by atoms. All of a sudden there are the atoms of dinosaurs, the atoms of pirates, the atoms of aliens from out of space right there in your living room. But can you touch them? Can you interact with these parallel universes? No, because you're vibrating at the wrong frequency. But it means that if you could vibrate at the correct frequency, then maybe you could enter a parallel universe. And this gets us down to a question that I often get asked. Is Elvis Presley still alive in a parallel universe? Well, According to one theory of the quantum, yes, he lives in a universe still belting out those hits, but he's vibrating not in our frequency. Sorry about that. This has enormous implications. It means there could be other universes out there. Universes where you married somebody different. You went to a different college. You chose a different career. Think about that. Your, your mind goes haywire. Your brain explodes thinking about all the parallel universes that you may have lived. This gets us back to Alice in Wonderland. The first mathematician to consider parallel universes was Charles Dodgson. Now, Charles Dodgson was an Oxford professor. He could not write under his real name. People would laugh at him. So he wrote under a pen name, Lewis Carroll. And that book became Alice in Wonderland, written by a professor of mathematics at Oxford University. So it was Einstein himself who introduced the concept of parallel universes. This is a wormhole. Perhaps one day we'll be able to travel through a wormhole, of course, many, many years in the future, to reach the stars. And Hollywood has discovered it. The Academy Awards, this time around, went to the multiverse theory a theory that came out of physics and has now infected Hollywood, California. Well, let me now end and we'll take listener questions. And let me now end on one final story. When I was a young boy, I had a role model. My role model was Albert Einstein. And let me tell you my favorite Einstein story. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him and the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times, I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache. I will put on a wig. I will be the great Einstein and you can put on a wig and be my, put on a jacket and be my chauffeur. So they switched places. He put on a wig, Einstein put on a jacket, and this went along famously until one day, a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur over here can answer it for you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And we'll now open it up to questions or comments from the audience. Thank you, Michelle. That was quite a presentation. I'm not even sure where to begin. Oh, wow, we've got parallel universes and wormholes and 
Um, that that's quite quite a lot to take in. Um, let's see. Why don't we? Um, so let me let me start with just the basics. Um, so ha have you seen a uh, have you seen the quantum computers? Uh, do can, like are they do they exist? Can you point to them? Where are they? Um, who operates them? Yeah, um, two weeks from now, uh, 60 Minutes is flying me out to California, Santa Barbara, where I'm going to visit the Google quantum computer. That sent the world's record two years ago, uh, beating out a conventional, ordinary, digital supercomputer. And they're going to film it. They're going to film this. I'm going to be the host of interacting with a quantum computer. And it'll air probably in fall for the fall season. And how large is that quantum computer? I mean, when I think of it, it seems like it would take up, I mean, you showed a picture of all the cooling cooling rods. Um, how big is it? Yes, it's a, it'll, it'll take up most of your living room space. These are not small objects. Basically to carry liquid helium to, to lower the temperature down to near absolute zero so that the slightest disturbance does not interfere with the calculations. And again, people are curious about this. The book, Quantum Supremacy, hit the New York Times bestseller list today. Just today, it hit the New York Times bestseller list, the book, Quantum Supremacy. Well, yeah, and uh, I want all our readers, I'm going to pull hold it up. We'll help. We can see the cover. It's a great cover. It's a great title. And it's just a great book. Um, you talked about electrons. Um, and there's a question, um, are is there anything other than electrons that can be two places at one time? Well, the Chinese are bidding on light. When you put on polarized lenses at the beach, the, the lens has striations that are vertical so that light that vibrates up and down can go through, but light that vibrates sideways cannot go through. In the same way, you can use beam splitters to split life in half, uh, to be, to split light beams in half. This is what your glasses do. <clears throat> and we use that principle to build a computer. Yes, no, yes, no. These decisions can be made at the, at the photonic level. And so, yes, yeah, so far we use electrons and light particles to make quantum computers. Okay. And is there, any, is there anything else on the horizon? Is there any other experiments being done with other kinds of uh, chemicals and elements? Well, any chemical process that is quantum mechanical can, in principle, be used to create a quantum computer. But right now, we're doing the easy ones. The easy ones are beams of light and electricity inside a wire or inside a little container. Uh, those are the easy things that we're using. But remember, Mother Nature does it with flowers, with trees, vegetation. Uh, with cells that uh, perform all the gyrations inside your body. They're all quantum processes, but they've been hidden from us because digital computers compute on zeros and ones, zeros and ones. Co digital computers are totally blind to this world. That's why we cannot cure cancer. That's why we cannot cure Alzheimer's disease. All these diseases operate at the molecular level. And that's exactly the home, the home of quantum computers. Um, someone just asked a question. Uh, you didn't address the limitations in the size for current quantum computers due to the instability of the qubits. Um, and, and do you think those silvery orb-shaped UFOs are bubbles of space-time? Okay, let's break it down into two questions. Uh, first of all, um, these quantum qubits, as they're called, rather than bits, are susceptible to vibrations, noise, high temperature. So the, the questioner is right, that there is a problem. And that's why these quantum computers are so big. Now, Mother Nature uses quantum mechanics uh, at the leaf level. You're talking about a leaf that is like a quantum computer. We require a chandelier's worth of cooling rods in order to create a quantum calculation. So Mother Nature is still ahead of us by quite a bit. Um, now, can you explain fusion um, to our listeners out there? I know that there was that big uh, ex experiment in California that got a lot of press. And um, explain to us what what it is and why it's it is significant. 
Well, uranium plants uh, that dot the countryside and we get energy from uh, depends on splitting the uranium atom apart. But that causes problems. It creates waste, enormous numbers of waste. The waste is hot, and that hot waste can create a meltdown. So these are some of the reasons why uranium is not preferred by Mother Nature. Mother Nature does not use uranium anywhere in the universe. Let me repeat that. In the universe, to the best of our knowledge, Mother Nature does not use uranium for power. What does nature use? Hydrogen. By fusing hydrogen, you create helium with energy added as an aside. That's why stars twinkle. That's why the sun shines. Children ask the question, mommy, daddy, what makes the stars shine? Fusion. Hydrogen combines with hydrogen to create helium plus energy. Now, fusion plants don't exist yet. That's the problem. They're unstable. The, the helium gas is very difficult to crush. That's why we need quantum computers to help stabilize the gas. So that's why we think that by mid-century, we could be in the fusion era. That is, we don't have to worry about global warming so much because we can phase out oil and coal. That's the promise of fusion. Infinite energy from seawater. Seawater is the basic fuel for a fusion plant. Now, this is the ideal plant. No nuclear waste, no meltdown. The fuel is basically uh, um, from, from Mother Nature water. What's there not to love in a fusion reactor? It's nature's choice. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. And at least it gives us some hope. Um, we'd certainly love to have a, you know, pr producing efficient energy without the waste. Mm -hmm. um, also, let's see, uh, let me see what other questions we have here. Um, is there a limit to how small silicon chips can be made? And is that one reason why quantum computing is uh, in our future? That's exactly right. He hit it on the head. What happens is transistors are smaller and smaller. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to try and get Michio Kaku back. Um, we're having a very interesting discussion about quantum computing and the future of that. Um, again, I'm going to show his book for those of you who are watching. Can we see it there? This is the cover. And it is just a fascinating book. And of course, we have it for sale at Book Passage. We have all his other amazing books for sale at Book Passage as well. And um, again, we're going to have this event archived. This is something that you might want to watch multiple times. And there's a lot, it's very meaty. There's a lot of information. And he's got this uh, incredible PowerPoint where he, uh, you know, kind of goes through the history of computers and then um, why quantum computing is just, you know, so important to our future. So I urge you all, um, you know, if you want to watch it again, it's going to be archived on our website, bookpassage.com. And we have a lot of amazing events coming up, as I mentioned earlier. So please look at our website for all the up-to-date information. Okay, I think we're getting him back. Oh, okay. All right. So we also have an event with Hernan Diaz. Uh, this is an amazing book called Trust. This book won the Pulitzer Prize. It's a novel. It's now out in paperback. I urge you all to look at to take a look at the event um, and also to read the book. It's just amazing. It's um, it's a it's a really interesting story that takes place kind of in the uh, I guess it's like the ninth, early nineteen twenties, a little before that. Um, a really surprising novel with twists and turns. Again, that is uh, the book is called Trust, and it's out in paperback. And uh, that will be an event at our Book Passage store in Corte Madera. Um, we also have a big event with uh, Isabel Allende. For those of you who are local, you know she is a Belvedere author. We love having her nearby and comes into the store often. And that event, I believe, is in June. I think it's June. I'm not going to get to show the date, but it's like mid-June. That's going to be at Dominican University. Um, and she will be in conversation with Javier 
Uh, let me see what his last name is. Um, okay, great. Yes, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. You know, the wonders of modern technology, right? Once more, yeah, we needed a we needed a quantum computer to keep you on to keep you on <laughs> there. I apologize for that. There's always some glitch someplace, but I hope I answered uh, a lot of the questions. If there's any more questions, I'd be ha happy to answer them. They're all in my book, uh, Quantum Supremacy, now a New York Times bestseller. All right, here's a picture of it. Again, a New York Times bestseller, and we've had the New York amazing New York Times bestselling author with us. Michio Kaku, we are so, so grateful you've joined us this evening. Thank you for spreading your word uh, to our Book Passage community. Um, it was very enlightened and, um, you know, lots of information packed in here. So again, if you want to watch this again, it's going to be on our website under archived events and the book. I'm going to hold it up one more time. Quantum Supremacy. It is available at Book Passage. I thank you all for joining us and for expanding your knowledge. Michio, thank you so much for spreading your message. We look and forward to your next book. And of course, we are going to love reading this one. And we have it all throughout the store. We're going to continue to promote it. It's an important message. Thank you for teaching us all about this. We appreciate it. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Okay.